Hi everyone, I'm Brooke and this is A Month of Accessible Elm. If you want to watch this performance live on your personal device, you can check out bit.ly slash elm dash ally and that ally has ones instead of l's. So, yay! Let's see if this will go on. Yay, okay, as I said, hi, I'm Brooke, I work at No Red Ink, and we write a lot of Elm over there, which is why I'm giving this presentation today. And over at No Red Ink, we do things like create interactive grammar quizzes for students that include their interests, like Britney Spears, which was definitely one of my interests when I was a third grader. Yeah, Britney. And today I'm gonna to be talking about the story of my foray into accessibility in Elm. But before, about, before I talk about that, I'm gonna tell you all about something else I'm super excited about which is habits. So I'm a person who likes making super big goals, including New Year's resolutions. And every year since like seventh grade, I've made some sort of resolution for myself. In seventh grade, it was like, I'm gonna go to the Olympics. And that was just the first in a string of failed New Year's resolutions, unfortunately. <laughs> so in 2019, I was thinking about what I wanted my New Year's resolution to be, and I was like, okay, what do I want? I think I want something along the lines of be healthy, now, as you might imagine, this might not have been the best New Year's resolution because it's super broad and vague. It could have meant anything. Like, was I saying I wanted to literally be a piece of broccoli, like doing pull-ups like in this GIF? I don't know. And in fact, this resolution encompasses like five of the top 10 New Year's resolutions. And as it stands, the typical New Year's resolution does not have that high of a success rate. Of the 60% of people who make resolutions, only about 8% keep them. And unfortunately, I don't tend to be one of that 8%. <laughs> so I was like, okay, I think I need to do something a little bit more effective this year if I actually wanna meet my resolution and not just make it. And I was thinking a little bit about why my resolutions tend to not be that effective. And two of the things I came up with was, one, my resolutions tend to be too ambiguous. And two, a year is a little bit too long-term for me. I tend to, get, tend to forget what my resolutions are, but like, February, which isn't great for a year-long resolution. So this year, rather than making a gigantic, big, ambiguous goal, like be healthy, I decided I wanted to take the approach of having these little monthly approachable habits. So instead of saying like, I wanna be healthy, I wanted to say something like, I'm gonna eat a carrot every day, which I'm not actually gonna do because I don't like carrots. But anyways, it was an approachable habit. So the actual first habit that I decided to take on was that I wanted to go lift weights twice a week for just one month. It was something I hadn't done before, so I was like, Meh, maybe I might hate it, but that's okay. If I hate it after a month, I'm just gonna let it go without guilt. And at the end of the month, I was like, hey, this lifting weights thing, it's, it's not so bad. Because it was a really specific habit that I decided to take up for just a month, I was able to keep it going. And I was like, yay, this habit thing is pretty cool. Big goals are scary, like a ghost emoji. The little habits are approachable, like a bear emoji. So I was like super excited about this habits thing. And at this point, maybe you're like, okay, Brooke, why are you telling me about habits? That's nothing revolutionary. There are lots of people talking about habits. For example, Gretchen Rubin, who wrote the book Better Than Before, which is something that people recommended to me after I, after I proposed this talk, and then I did go and read it. Or Atomic Habits by James Clear, which is another best-selling book that someone recommended to me that I haven't read. Or perhaps at some point your manager's been like, hey, you need to make a SMART goal, which is a specific, measurable, attainly, relevant, and timely goal. Anyways, I mention all this to say that habits aren't something that I came up with, obviously. They're something that is talked about a lot because they're super effective and they work. So with this, I was like, okay, bring on the monthly habits, let's go. I want some good habits that are purposeful, so they're gonna feed into my bigger goal of being healthy. Specific, so I'm gonna make them like super focused and measurable and then time limited. I'm just gonna take them on for a month, and if I don't like them after a month, I'm just gonna let them go without guilt. Cool, so now you get to look at my habit log, yeah. In January, I was like, I'm gonna floss every night so my dentist stops yelling at me. <laughs> Mom, if you're listening to this, I'm sorry I wasn't flossing regularly until January, but I promise it's a habit now, it worked out, check. Now it feels pretty natural, so kept that one. In February, I was like, I'm gonna bike or walk to 80% of places in a 10 mile radius, gonna reduce my fuel usage, this is gonna be great. This one didn't exactly work out. I made it to like 75% in my recorded spreadsheet. I uh, got sick a lot and it rained, so I was like, okay, I'm gonna let this one go, try to have no guilt about it, and I'll pick it up again in a better month. And then in March, I was like, I'm gonna take my vitamins daily. That sounds like a good way to be healthy. And that one worked out as well. So I didn't really have a 100% success rate, but I was like, 
Yeah, overall this small habit thing seems to be working. I'm into this habit thing. Yay, and I could feel my successes accumulating and I was like, hey, I might actually make my New Year's resolution this year. This is great. So, excellence, on to another big goal. In January, the company that I work at, No Reading, decided to start an excellence initiative. And broadly what this means is that we wanted to brainstorm shared standards of excellence as an engineering department. And one of the things that kept coming up as we were brainstorming was that if we want our product to be excellent, our site should be accessible to a diverse range of students. At this point, maybe you're like, web accessibility, what's that? Or alternatively, maybe you're a web accessibility expert and you're like, yeah, you guys serve teachers and students. Of course your site should be accessible. I found myself somewhere in between. I was like, I know I'm supposed to be making my work accessible, but I don't exactly know what that means. I don't know who I'm serving. I don't know what the standards are for accessibility. So I decided to do a little bit of research. So the first thing I wanted to look into was, for whom am I making my work accessible? And as I go through these st statistics, for scale, there are 327 million people in the United States, so you can keep that in mind. Um, and so yeah, accessibility for whom? When we're talking about web accessibility, we're talking about making our work accessible to people with disabilities. This can include the 285 million people worldwide who are blind or visually impaired. And one tool that can help out these users is a screen reader, which is a assistive technology that reads the content of web pages out loud. This is a screenshot of voiceover utility, which is included on all Macs. We're also talking about the 275 million users who are deaf or hearing impaired. So these users can be helped by things like closed captioning, yay! And we're also talking about users with conditional disabilities. So this could include a software engineer with carpal tunnel syndrome who needs to keyboard navigate instead of using a mouse. And it also includes, for example, someone who's trying to access a website in a loud restaurant where they can't hear the content of a page. Or someone who's accessing a site in a language that they don't typically speak. So these are just a few of the user group that accessibility best practices benefit. Really, accessibility best practices benefit everyone. And I'm just gonna make an assumption here that we would all like our applications to be accessible to all of these user groups. Because we are an empathetic crew and we care a lot about our users. So that's sort of the who of accessibility. What do we actually mean by accessible? What does it mean to make the content of our websites accessible? So for this, I'm gonna reference the Web Content for Accessibility Guidelines, which has a lot of great content about accessibility and what it means. And one of the acronyms that they use to describe accessibility from a really broad level is POOR, which means perceivable, operable, understandable, and robust. So let's go through each of those. When we talk about making a website perceivable, we mean that the user is able to perceive the content. And ways to do that include including alt text for images so that users with visual impairment can perceive the content of those images, ensuring that content has sufficient contrast, and adding captions for multimedia and audio content. We also want our sites to be operable, which means that users can operate the app using a keyboard, not just using a mouse. It also means that ensuring that users have enough time to read and use the content of a web page so it's not just flying by super quickly. And we want our content to be understandable. So the text should be readable and users should understand how to correct mistakes on things like forms. And lastly, we want the content of our pages to be robust, which means that content is robust across tools, including assistive technologies like screen readers. So that's like, from a super broad perspective, what we mean when we talk about making our sites accessible. And now you might be wondering, okay, so like, why is accessibility so difficult? We're all in agreement that our apps should be usable by a diverse range of students, but still, accessibility can feel like a super daunting task. In fact, when you hear excellence in accessibility, your big scary goal alarm might be going off. Because much like, be very healthy, excellence in accessibility can feel super broad and unattainable. Maybe you've made an accessibility goal at some point, and you've gone over to the web content for accessibility guidelines, you've been all excited, and then you started scrolling, and scrolling, and scrolling, and scrolling through the guidelines, and then you're like, wait, never mind, this is scary, and then ran away. So my usual reasons are, I don't know anything about accessibility, and I don't know how to check for accessibility, and adding accessibility takes too much time. So at this point, I was like, wait a minute. This tiny habit thing worked for me earlier in the year with my personal habits. What if I could use them for this giant goal of excellence and accessibility as well? Maybe I need a tiny habit. 
So with the big goal of excellence and accessibility in mind, I decided to make the little goal of writing UI tests based on interactions that would help someone using a screen reader navigate the page. Bringing me to the month of Accessible Elm. So as with my other successful habits, this little habit was purposeful in that it fed into the big goal of excellence and accessibility, specific in that it was one tiny chunk that I could measure, and time limited. I was going to try it out for a month, and if I didn't really like approaching accessibility from this angle, I was going to try something else. Also, it was a pretty good habit for me to adopt because I consider TDD one of my existing good habits, so it could sort of hook into that. So with that, on to the project. The project that I was working on during the month of Accessible Elm is No Red Ink's interest page. I said before that in No Red Ink, students can do interactive grammar quizzes containing their interests. This is the page where the students come when they first sign up for our website where they can actually select their interests. It's a super important page for users to be able to get through because if they can't select their interests on this page, then they can't get to any of the other parts of our site. It's also one of the oldest pages on our site. And when I originally started working on it, it was written in React. So Elmifying it was a great opportunity to audit the accessibility and see where we could make improvements. And I was working on this page with fellow conference speaker Katie Hughes as well. Yay! So how would we verify that our efforts towards making, making this page more accessible actually worked? So the best way to do this would have been to verify with a real screen reader user and ensuring that they were able to use it. But I needed a faster feedback loop while I was developing. So the next best way would have been to verify myself with a screen reader, like VoiceOver, which is included on my Mac. However, when I started this month, I didn't know how to use VoiceOver, so it felt like a little bit too steep of a learning curve to get started out with. So, all right, I decided to just remove browser styling from the page to see the most egregious errors. Now, this isn't really a perfect method, but it would reveal some things. For example, it would reveal which non-interactive elements had event listeners. And I'll talk a little bit more about why that's bad in just a second. It would also reveal which places we were using background images to convey content. Another thing I'll talk about in just a second. What this wouldn't reveal were things like where we had images with no alt text, or when we're using roles and widgets improperly. So again, this isn't the perfect method for auditing accessibility. It was just a way to get started really fast. So, okay, let's do this. So in the user flow for selecting interests, the first thing that a user needed to be able to do was to select an interest. And in the styled view, there are all these things that have the appearance of buttons that have the titles of interests that students can select. For example, this arrow is pointing to a button that says Crazy Rich Asians. So in the unstyled view, there's something a little bit different. Rather than these buttons, it's revealed that all of these interests are just LIs. They don't really have the appearance of something clickable. And that's because an LI isn't really meant to be clickable. That's not great, because a screen reader actually isn't able to focus on LIs. If we want something to trigger an effect on the page, we should be using an interactive element like a button. OK, so that's not great. This isn't really operable to our screen reader users so far. Let's move on to the next part of the interest flow. So once the user had selected interests, they needed to be able to deselect the ones that they didn't want. So in the styled view, there's a bar up here that has all the interests the user can deselect with little X's in the corner to indicate that these interests can be deselected. Now, in the unstyled view, again, there's something a little bit different. So in the select interest flow, we at least had LIs that had the titles of the interests. So they weren't operable, but they were perceivable. For the deselect interest flow, well, we have an empty LI. And that's because we were using the background image of the interest to convey the meaning of that button. So this is super, this is, this is not good. In fact, scream emoji. Because not only was this not operable for a screen reader user, it wasn't even perceivable. OK, so far, not, not great, not great. Um, so let's continue onwards. Assuming that a user had been able to select interests and deselect the interests they didn't want, they needed to be able to continue onwards to the next page. So in the style view, there's this thing that looks like a button that has the word continue on it. And a user should be able to press this button in order to continue onwards. And hey, good news. In the unstyled view, this is actually a button. So we just have to maintain this functionality. This is something that a screen reader user would be able to operate. OK, so let's go on to the Elm code that we use to make this happen. 
So I said before that I wanted the habit to be writing tests to enforce accessibility. And so the first thing that we need to do is we need to set up a test. And as part of that acronym POR, we said that we wanted our pages to be understandable. So the first thing I wanted to do was test for clear instructions on the page. And a tool that we often use to do this at Narrowed Inc. is Aaron Von Haar's Elm Program Test which Tessa has saved me from explaining, yay! But I'll explain it again, just in case. Um, so this was written by Aaron Vonderhaar. It's a really awesome tool because you set it up really similarly to how you would set up a regular ELM program, which is awesome because I don't want to have to remember how to set up two different things if I can just remember how to set up one. So in this setup here, we pass in our real init function, our real view function, our real update function from our ELM program, and then we can start off the program with some test flags. And then from there, just like with Elm test explorations, or Elm explorations tests, we can perform assertions on the view. For example, we can ensure that the view has the text select your interest to ensure that the page is understandable to a user. Great, and this test actually already passes because we always had the instructions there. So yay, that's happy. So now let's add to our test. We also want the, the part where we select interest to be operable to a screen reader user. Now, in the past, what I would probably do to test something like this would be to find that interest button by its class name and then simulate a click on it. Now, this isn't really great. First of all, a class name isn't really helpful to a screen reader user. It doesn't really provide any sort of semantic value to them, and screen readers pretty much just ignore class names. Second of all, we might be clicking on a non-interactive element in that test. And in fact, that test would pass with RLIs, which aren't really supposed to be clickable. So, I'm gonna come back to that in a second, but first on to another tool that we use at Network Inc., which is Richard Feldman's Elm CSS. And back in the olden days, aka like a year ago, we used Elm CSS 12. And Elm CSS 12 looked a little bit like this. So we would have this type where we would write out all of our class names, and then when we wanted to attach a class name to an element, we would do something like this. And then in the DOM, that, that would translate to this sturdy, dependable class name that I could use to test with which would enable me to do this. But then, Elm CSS 13 arrived. <laughs> and suddenly, styles lived in line. And instead of forming these nice, dependable class names in the DOM, they translated into these nonsense hashes that were now, you know, sort of nonsense to me as a developer, and I couldn't rely on them. And I was like, oh, Richard, does this mean I can't write my tests anymore? And Richard was kind of like, no, no, you should be like selecting by like semantic attributes that help accessibility. And I sort of ignored that because I was all grumpy about not being able to write tests. <laughs> so then I started doing something like this. I was like, you know what? I can't depend on LCSS classes anymore, so I'm just going to attach my own good old dependable arbitrary classes to things. Uh, everything's going to be great. I'm going to test based on that. I can still write my tests. All cool. And then when this month came around, I was like, wait a minute. Isn't there a better way to do this? Richard told me earlier, but you know. <laughs> so before our test looked something like this, we were selecting by our class name. And, okay, so this is what's great. Turns out that Elm Program Test actually has a helper for click button, and you just pass it the text that's in the button. So now not only is this fewer lines of code, both in the test and in the implementation, but I'm also enforcing accessibility at the same time and ensuring that I'm clicking on something that's actually meant to be clicked. So, yay, that's great. Writing a test to enforce accessibility was actually easier than what I'd been doing all along. And with that, we've got our failing test. Yay. So our original button, which as detectives we determined was an LI, um, it looked a little bit like this. And we were able to do this because in LMHTML we have a type signature that is something like this. An LI takes a list of attribute messages, a list of HTML messages as children, and it produces an HTML message. Now, this is already awesome from a screen reader perspective because we produce HTML, valid HTML markup by default, which is good for screen readers. But the fact that we can pass in an attribute message means that we can attach click listeners or whatever event listeners to things that really ought not to have event listeners attached to them. So there's actually an awesome tool that can prevent this, which is Tessa Kelly's accessible HTML, and also accessible HTML with CSS, which is the happy combination of accessible HTML with styled HTML. So, yay. So in this type signature, rather than passing in a list of attribute messages, 
we pass in a list of attribute nevers, which means that when I try to do something bad, like attach an on-click listener to an LI, I'll get a compiler error like this. Yay. So now not only is accessibility our habit, but it's our compiler's habit as well. And with that, well, with this, when we change it to a button to make the compiler happy, our test passes as well. So that's great. Yay. So, so far, I've talked a lot about buttons, but it isn't all about buttons. If you remember from a few slides ago, um, we said that the deselect interest button wasn't perceivable to a screen reader user because we were trying to use the background image to convey content about what that button was supposed to do. So here's another helpful part of um, accessible HTML that we can use to help with that. The power of invisibility. So this is something provided by accessible HTML which creates an attribute message, which makes content invisible without making it inaccessible. So now we can add some sort of label to that button that says what it's supposed to do and hide it from the styled view while still making it accessible to screen readers. So that's super cool. And originally I would have thought this would have done something simple like attach CSS display none to an element. Don't do that, that actually hides it from screen readers as well. Uh, the actual CSS attributes that this generates is a little bit more complicated. It's like position absolute, height one, picks one, overflow hidden, blah, blah, blah. Um, so instead of having to remember all that, you can just like use the power of invisibility from accessible HTML and everything will work out great. Um, so now with the power of invisibility, our deselect interest button looks is something like this. So we have our button with an on-click listener, and then within that, we can put the invisible text for deselect interest name. Um, note here that I haven't attached all the CSS styles to this button, so there were, it's not just a background image. Uh, yay, okay, so that's awesome. It turns out that Elm is a great language for testing and implementing accessible features. We all like Elm because it nudges us towards good patterns, and these packages can help extend Elm's capability. Awesome. So let's take a look at the final test flow. And it's actually surprisingly simple. All we had to do was click button, select Beyonce, click button, deselect Beyonce. Don't know why you would want to do that, but we're testing here. And then <laughs> click button, continue, and boom, our test is complete. So on to the results. Did we actually make the page more accessible via the month of accessible testing? So before, in the unstyled view, all the interests were just a bunch of LIs with on-click listeners attached. That was not operable for a screen reader user. Now, they're all buttons. So that's great, our screen reader user can operate these buttons, which is happy times. Before with deselecting interests, we had these empty LIs where we were trying to use background images to convey the meaning. Now in our unstyled view, they have this label which says deselect Supergirl, which uh, I found a screen reader pronounces as super girl. Um, <laughs> and they're buttons, so they're operable. And then the true test. Does it actually work on a screen reader? Um, I'm not actually gonna play this video because as I discovered last night, the audio quality is embarrassingly bad for a talk about accessibility. But here is the link in the presentation if you wanna check it out on your own. Uh, the short answer is that yes, our screen reader user can operate the page and you know, it's still not perfect, but it's definitely improved and operable. So I started out this talk talking about habits. Let's get back to that. I decided to make the habit to only write tests that would enforce accessibility for a screen reader user. It was something that I tried. It was something that I managed to keep up for the whole month. And then after the month, I was like, wait, this is actually a whole lot easier than what I've been doing before with the whole like weird adding arbitrary classes thing. So yeah, I'm gonna keep this habit, this is great. And you might be wondering at this point, was that too small? Brooke, all you did was add a few buttons and labels. I could do that. To which I'm like, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I would argue that tiny habits that you can keep are more impactful than sweeping resolutions that you'll give up. And with that, I invite all of you to make an accessibility goal of your own this month. If testing isn't really your thing, I mean it should be, but if it's not, here are some other ideas. Um, so earlier I went through that giant list of web content for accessibility guidelines and I was like scrolling, scrolling, scrolling. I wouldn't ac actually recommend starting there if you're interested in picking an item from the list. I would recommend going to alliproject.com slash checklist, just picking an item from there and using it in your code all month. And if your team is open to new Elm packages, I would also recommend switching to Tessa Kelly's accessible HTML. 
just bring in this import line as HTML, and bam, your compiler is going to tell you all the places where you're making things clickable that ought not to be clickable. And I've also talked a lot about accessibility from an individual habits-based perspective. But accessibility is something that's important to prioritize also from the corporate and industry-wide level. So consider something like advocating for accessibility training at your workplace once a week to whoever will listen to you. Or you might consider downloading a browser extension like Axe and checking every page that you work on. Even if you don't fix all the accessibility errors right away, it'll give you a good sense of where things could be improved. So yeah, that's my talk. Um, remember, doing small things is better than no doing no things. Thank you so much for listening. Um, I don't really have social media, but if this talk inspired you to make an accessibility habit, I encourage you to Slack me, at Brooke, on the Elm Slack. And a special thanks to all these people who made awesome packages and helped me with my talk, um, and all the awesome ElmConf organizers as well. Thank you so much. <laughs>